Lovely. It is now my great, great pleasure to introduce our next guest. His name is Eric Rickart, and he's the founder and CEO of Greenview. Greenview has a very, very important role to play, especially now as our world is re-engineering, conscious of the impact that we have. Greenview supports organizations with their corporate responsibility and sustainability platforms to drive profitability, streamline data management, and keep up with the trends effectively providing effective communication to stakeholders, leveraging the power of data. Again, they are a critical industry voice as we look to the future of hospitality, and we look at doing that with enormous responsibility. Eric, we're delighted to have you with us. The stage is yours, sir. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. And it's always a pleasure to see you, or even when virtually. And uh, thank you, those who got up early this morning. Thank you, uh, those in Asia and in some night owls in the United States and the Americas. Um, Eric Carter from Greenview, and in the next 15 minutes, I want to present to you some trends in environmental and social resilience. And to start off, I wanted to just explain, where does resilience come from? What does the term resilience mean? Resilience is essentially being able to cope with the external factors that affect your business. And that's what we're seeing more and more on environmental and social sides every day. Resilience was already slated to be the buzzword in the industry, in real estate, in sustainability for 2020, even before COVID-2019. Um, and that's basically because the environmental, social and governance or ESG related factors that affect a business are now multiplying every day. Uh, just an example, plastic, which was the topic in sustainability um, last two years. Now, prior to 2018, and this got real public sentiment, there were very little, if any, hotel companies, very few, who actually had plastic reduction elimination as a strategic priority to their business. But once that hit and became high on consumer sentiment, we saw the massive deluge of, of programs, of, of commitments and of things coming from all across the industry. And that's exactly the kind of resilience you need is how can you manage something like that that will hit you, um, which is a, it's a sustainability issue, an environmental issue, and a social issue. And what everybody has asked us since then is, what's next? What is it that's going to come next after plastic? And our answer is always something. Something is going to come, whether it's, and we don't know, whether it's the issues around food waste, whether it's the issues around migrant workers, whether it's the issues around chemicals, water stress, um, there's always something that's going to be happening and more and more about environmental and social topics that you need to be prepared for. And so resilience really amounts to understanding that these myriad and multitude of factors are needing to be addressed and managed in your organization so you can react. And so what we want to present are some of the trends and what's going on, how you can react, uh, and how you can look into some of these trends a little more deeply. And so the first question that um, we're seeing in, in general in the environmental sustainability world is, is now that we're in this, this do or die situation, will sustainability take a backseat to survival and then to hygiene? And our answer is, is no. Um, first off, I don't think we're going to see many people saying, I care less about the environment and its people now because of COVID, especially not among younger generations. The collaboration, the community sentiment that's, that's put forth is, is amazing. Um, now, there may be some things that we'll have to take a back seat or we'll need to um, slow a little bit. For example, the single-use plastic elimination programs, they may have to be rethought by some companies now that uh, customers may accept or even demand more hygiene related uh, products, services such as plastic. And so we might have to have two different types of plastic, the single use plastic we can get rid of, and then that that needs and has a place in the in, in the insert. And so we can talk a little bit more about that later, but that's um, what we're seeing is there's some minor hiccups, minor delays, but overall the ESG world is strong. And we're seeing it from our uh, our, our customers from the industry, the pressures from, from customers, the real physical risks, they're all going to increase. And so with that, we know that even though the COVID is the current and immediate focus, as we get back to this, these factors will become even more important. So uh, some examples of this. First, in the short term, we're seeing investors look to ESG now because everybody needs an alpha. And so there is a race to compare and see do companies that manage environmental and social issues well outperform others? And the answer is yes, and there's research coming in. There's an interesting one from HSBC that came out recently, I can, I can send it, it's on our LinkedIn page, which compares climate-based businesses against non, and it also compares businesses that perform strongly in ESG versus uh, the weaker performers, and they're outperforming. Uh, and that's a bank, and they're actually looking into this more seriously. And so we're seeing more and more of this 
uh, race to compare, which means the evaluation of a company's management of environmental and social issues becomes very important. And it's not just the climate change or the, or the immediate financial uh, disaster issues. Uh, Just Capital is one of these other ESG uh, firms. They have investment products and they rate companies primarily on social aspects. They're actively right now heavily monitoring and rating how they perceive companies to be treating their workforce during COVID-19. And they're demonstrating empirically that those companies who treat their workers better and have better programs will outperform other companies. So, it, and it traces back, we saw early this year, um, Larry Fink from BlackRock in the statement in January really changed the game. And that has not changed, which is BlackRock recognizing that we are going to focus on ESG and on investments because we see real risk, real opportunity, and real transition. And we want to make sure companies we invest in are ready for that. And then they've since followed suit and they invest in a lot of real estate, a lot of hospitality, and there's a lot coming on that can't be ignored even in this current situation. It's not just publicly traded companies. We're seeing even private equity, it, lenders are looking to this, even family offices now. Everybody realizing that resilience does involve environmental issues and social issues that come in tandem. Uh, in Asia, we're also seeing this and we're seeing a lot of activity in Asia, not just Europe, but across the, across the board, especially as capital flows are global now. Uh, who's investing in Asia and who's investing from Asia, these flows are now mixing. And with that mix comes these requirements to look at ESG. So let's get into some practical uh, then in terms of resilience and what does this mean? First, the, the real impacts right now, look at the properties. One of the things we're seeing on the, on the resilience is how do you, let's, we need to reduce costs, we need to protect our assets. Uh, the first department, the DOEM property, the engineering department facility management, they're working, they're there, even when occupancy is low. And from the, ent the companies we're working with, we're actually seeing the engineering teams on property, the most engaged we've ever seen them because they're there, they're working, but some actually have some downtime and now it's the time to get to those projects on efficiency, on, um, on planning for, for CapEx, on the nice to haves that were not available before because everybody was so busy running high occupancies. Um, we've seen this at property engineering teams and corporate engineering teams. And this is an interesting time because one, you can potentially finally understand the base load of your property, which is how much energy does it take just to turn my property on without achieving any occupancy? And so looking at that and, and then looking why, how come it's not as low as it should be? Water, for example, shouldn't my water be going down more? There's a lot that can be done looking and taking the time now that you have to look at your potential opportunities to reduce energy and reduce water, because that's going to be your number one cost aside from labor on your P&L. Now, this seems like an obvious, straightforward one, but this is the thing that keep, we keep hammering home and we keep seeing this over and over. Uh, the opportunity is there. So we manage the industry's largest benchmarking data set of energy, water, and carbon annually. We do this with dozens of companies, almost 600 geographies in terms of markets, uh, countries, climate segments, um, and we had 18,000 hotels in our database in the last year. And because of this, we can start to isolate the performance and we see some really interesting trends that now that we have this time, we can look at. Uh, I'll share that we love benchmarking in this industry, so let's be resilient and keep doing it. Um, first, some interesting facts we've seen, this information is, is published, available through Cornell University's Center for Hospitality Research. Um, in Asia Pacific, a lot of the data comes in partnership with Horwath HTL Asia Pacific. And we can see what is the median water usage per occupied room across full service hotels in the region. Interesting, for example, that Kuala Lumpur has about twice as much the uh, energy, the water intensity as Singapore. And so we start to look and see, well, what are the markets we should be looking at and concentrating on for more of this information? Uh, but the most important and interesting thing we've seen, and we'll take the case of Thailand, is that in pretty much any market around the world, if you take the, there's such a wide range of performance in energy and water efficiency and uh, intensity. And if you look at the quartiles, forget the outliers, look at the quartiles. If there's 100 hotels in Bangkok, the hotel that's at number 25 is performing 50% better than the hotel that's at 75. And this happens, you can see, for example, Koh Samoy, the 25th percentile is performing almost two and a half times better than the uh, 75th percent. And so we see this in every market, not just in Asia. Uh, you see this here's in, in Europe, London, Paris, the, the ratio is about 1.5 to two, meaning the myriad of uh, building design of capital expenditures of uh, capital equipment, ff &E, but also operating practices will um, determine where you fit in this range. And there's always room for improvement. Now, it's not just energy, it's water. Water can even be sometimes 
more intense. And we see this in some markets in Europe. Uh, we see, again, going back to Thailand, we see, and it's not just full service hotels, but we can see in limited service, for example, it's sometimes even greater for water, that there are some really big efficiency opportunities in water, and now's the time to take a look at them. Uh, that in the short term, look at your energy, look at your water, now is a good time. Second, for the midterm, uh, we know money's tight, and now is the time to look at green finance, and we're seeing a lot of this happening. Um, just quickly, a couple to mention, you have green bonds. They have the idea that you can actually get capital at a lower cost of capital, lower interest rate. Green bonds are becoming more interesting. We've seen some examples in Asia, Swire Properties, CDO, uh, floating green bonds in order to fund energy efficiency uh, renewables. And we've seen this across the world. Uh, in the U.S., we even have host hotels and resorts. Um, so there's also that. There's, there's funding mechanisms. There's sustainability-backed loans. SDG loans where lenders will give you a loan in better terms in exchange for a commitment and demonstrating performance in environmental social areas. Uh, Swire Properties also did this. Um, now you have this all over the world, there's different mechanisms. In the United States, you have PACE financing for clean energy and efficiency, and some lenders are now looking toward this as we need more lending mechanisms. And it's definitely a better ESG option than the uh, PPP money as we've seen some, some backlash for. Uh, another example in developing world, there, there's plenty of initiatives. One is the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program, which is actually an NGO, but they have they've have millions allocating capital toward energy efficiency products in developing countries. That will then tackle the big issue of phasing out refrigerants in cooling equipment. Um, another financing mechanism we've seen is a changing from CapEx to OpEx in systems in even your HVAC equipment, um, which lowers capital needs for those who are now strapped and also uh, help build scale toward efficiency and renewables for those who are now managing that full time. Um, so those are the some of the midterm things. Midterm, green finance. There's opportunities in ESG and sustainability to tackle uh, and tap into some capital sources. Back quickly then in the long term, because what we're really talking about sustainability is always, always long term. And when I look at some of the trends and we see what's going on now uh, versus what's been going on in the last few uh, decades, the uh, here is the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the temperature change. Trend is up. Here is the number of weather ex extreme weather related events in Asia also has gone up. Here is the amount of plastic been produced and plastic in the oceans. These trends are all exponential and growing. And yes, we will see a slowdown in 2020 because of, of COVID and reduced travel and reduced consumption in general. But the trends, we're far away from actually making a, um, a dent in any of this. And so um, one thing we need to see is how are the environmental impacts associated with climate change, with changing atmospheres and its, and its impacts going to affect your business. And so long-term, the assessment of issues such as water scarcity, such as potential impacts to biodiversity, sea level rise, precipitation change, temperature change, um, socioeconomic conditions of a local, a local destination, and regulatory and policy frameworks. These are all the types of assessment work that will need to be done when looking at investments in real estate because what we've seen in this business, um, travel slump, Airlines can stop flying, cruise lines can stop going, tour operators can stop selling, but hotels are there, hotels are in the community, and you're gonna be physically in that destination. So resiliency really is looking at what are the potential impacts and then how do I mitigate those? Um, now, if I look at a few trends in this, just to, just to show how this can uh, be looked at, go back to Thailand. Now, it's not that the entire world has the same problems. They're isolated and need to prepare for them. So for example, we see that uh, in a myriad of what the temperature is going to be like, precipitation, sea level rise, flood, and risk of cost increase. Um, in this, we see Chiang Mai, for example, is forecast to have a high reduction in, in rainfall. They have a high water stress, which means there's a lot more water demand than, than uh, supply. And the water utility is actually undervalued six times what it should be based on that stress. And so by looking at this, you can then give the business case, tap into that funding to invest in resiliency and efficiency for the transition to a cleaner energy world and the world that has more circular economy and more understanding of its resources. So these kind of things are long-term what you're going to need to take a look at when looking at resilience on the environmental side. Then finally to wrap up, we're gonna see a lot right now on the uh, relationship and the role of hotels in society. Now hotels have always been a source of disaster relief. That's always been part of hotel programs. Um, but now with COVID, we're seeing some of the underlying opportunities that have already been there. The role hotels play in society. So it's not just a matter of being a place to hold up, but strategic looking into how this can impact your business and how your hotel relates to the community. Providing food, shelter, and a place away from home when needed. 
that will take deeper meaning as the impacts of climate change and others will become more prevalent and pressing. So it's time to take another look at social responsibility within the lens of risk management and strategy. Where can we find revenue in times of disaster? Who can we partner with? Now, I'll say no more of that because we're going to see, and we have seen a lot of initiatives coming out. New initiatives, branded programs, partnerships, and commitments around this area, just as we did with plastic in 2019. And so to conclude, resilience means properly setting up the governance and management mechanisms to continually assess and incorporate ESG into your business. Because unfortunately, we're going to face a lot more situations, a lot more of these issues, and it's a matter of how we prepare for them and how we then deal with them and transition accordingly that will help us to thrive. And so COVID will definitely be a lesson. There are those, those kind of parallels that are being made, but we definitely know that the impacts and related social aspects of them are going to be issues we need to deal with in the future. Thank you. Hello, Eric. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. And it's so important that um, you know, you're opening the conference along with Jesper because these issues of environmental trends, social trends, resilience is so important for our industry. Now, listen, a quick question for you. So at what stage in hotel development could we be looking into sustainability? We have a lot of hotel developers in the audience today. And, and they look at in terms of these resilient issues and how do they go? Well, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you for taking the, uh, the question and, and inviting me here. It's a pleasure. Uh, to answer your question, the very beginning. Uh, we've seen this as the fundamental systemic problem that, that we've sort of peeled back the onion layer is that uh, developers, owners tended to opt to rely on the operators or the brands to come in with the solutions. But often because the hotel's already been designed, it's operator selection, but it's too late. Uh, the, the loan has already been secured, the assessments have already been done or not. So it needs to be very beginning. Any partner involved in those early areas of feasibility, of design, uh, MEP, uh, community relations, all of that is when you need to take a look at this and then look, what are the opportunities for financing, for design, for relations? And then you're not sort of just uh, going to the operator once you select, but you then can have a better dialogue going okay. forward. Okay. All right. Well, listen, Eric, listen, thank you so much for, for joining us and for being on the stage. And uh, if anybody's got any questions, how do they make? I will be in and out of the expo all day. Meanwhile, I manage my two-year-old here at home. And uh, otherwise, you can, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn. And uh, always looking forward to discussing. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much, Eric.